Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here this morning. Happy Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. So we got something. Let's, <laughs> let's stand up and let's give them a shout this morning. Come on. Come on, put your heads together.
It sounded like you all were ready to let heaven invade this morning. Woo! Let me hear you.
Come on, sing this with me. And oh, my Redeemer lives, we will worship you, Lord. So just take a moment and close your eyes. Take and put everything else, every other concern you have, just throw it away for just a moment. Focus on one thing and one thing only. Focus on right here, right now, being in the presence of God. Think of what we're here to celebrate today. That we had a God who loved us so much that he sent his only son to be beaten, bloodied, and killed just for us, just for you. How he was taken, hung up on a cross, humiliated, spit on, made less of a man. And he did it out of love, just for you. And once he breathed his final breath, he wasn't done there. He came back again. When they rolled away the stone of that tomb, they found that it was empty. And they found that our God had resurrected and he was been born again. Just like you, just like me. God came to die to show us that we are not lost, that we all can be saved. I want you guys to sing this out with me today. Just close your eyes, lift your hands, and sing this out. Your words are water to my soul. Your very breath gives me life. You came and died to set us free. My Father God lives here. Your words are water to my soul. 
Let's sing this out. Saturday was silent, joy it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. But since when has impossible? Ever stop you? Come on, guys! I want to hear you sing this out. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the phrase make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave. I'm coming out. I'm gonna live. Gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Men 
Pentecostal fire stirring something new. You're not going to run out of miracles anytime soon. Yeah. Just as the storm that was rolling 
just lift your hands and praise God this morning. Come on, lift them high. Welcome to Cornerstone Family Church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are delighted that you are here. And if you've been looking for a church home, we hope that you have found it this morning. Again, welcome. Hey, church family at home that can't be with us this morning. Just a couple quick announcements this morning. Pastor Appreciation Weekend next weekend has been postponed. We'll let you know when it's going to be rescheduled. But as of right now, we're postponing all of next Sunday's activities. But Thank you for those of you that signed up. We'll um, do it again in just a few short weeks. I want to remind you guys that there is no activity on campus this week. We will be having spring break. So enjoy your family. Enjoy just a time of, of just spending time with your family and God this week. And again, there will be no activities on the campus here at CFC this week. This morning as we get ready to take up the offering. I just want to give a shout out to those of you that make ministry happen in this place. It's because of you and your generous giving that ministry takes place. So shout out to you guys that so faithfully give every single Sunday. Father, I thank you for the people that have hearts to give in this place. God, they're giving into something that is way bigger than ourselves. God, we're giving into eternity where it will know no end. Father, we may not see all the fruit of our labor and all the fruit of our giving this side, but God, in eternity, we're going to get to see, and we're going to hear the stories of lives impacted because of generous, generous hearts that gave into your kingdom. We honor you, and we celebrate you for giving your only son. 
And the best part, he rose. Thank you, God. We honor you this morning. Amen. Just bring your tithing offering toward, please. And children, just stay put until after the special music this morning. Jam, you can come on in now, please. Good morning, church family. Oh, I'm just so happy to be here. <laughs> um, it has been a long journey. It was about three years ago, my husband found this song, which is typical. He finds a lot of wonderful praise and worship music. So this particular song, we listen to it, and the more I listen to it, I just begin to see a vision of the dance that we're getting ready to do. And it wasn't just that, it was, it pulled at my soul. It was just in the midst of the things that we were going through, the political chaos, you know, three years ago before the pandemic. And it had a message. And the message just really, it, it really taught me some lessons. And so I'm here to ask you guys and pray to, and hope that you will receive, hear this message, receive the message and that you will believe it. It's not just about the dance, but it's the word, okay?
Show me a face Fill up this space My world needs you right now My world needs you right now I can't escape Being afraid Fill me with you Show me your face Fill up this space My world needs you right now My world needs you right now I can't escape Being afraid Fill me
fill the space My world needs you right now My world needs you <laughs> After Jesus died, they put Jesus in a tomb. They wrapped him with some white paper. They put a big stone around it and placed guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda while eating hot Tito's. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland and then have a party by himself. <laughs> the okay. Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> he probably went out there and there's just throw eggs everywhere, and then he's gonna say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. You need to get some money. <laughs> Three days later, there was a big earthquake. <laughs> I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like, I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking, run for your lives. <laughs> and the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, Don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the go tell every go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has risen from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No! That couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came, just was there. I am Jesus. I am the. I'm the. I am the Son of the Lord God, and I am Jesus, your friend. And then the disciples said, "Jesus, it's you!" Yay! Jesus is alive! Totes cool. Jesus, before he left to heaven, he said, I have done what I have came to do. And then he risen, then he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, holy guacamole. I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome. Now what? Let's go tell the news. <laughs> oh, and now you guys know exactly what's going on in our children's classrooms this morning. <laughs> you need second through sixth grade to leave this place. See you, children. I tried to get those kids to sit down and stay, but they'd already been programmed. To... This is our only Sunday of the year where I have to walk around and give everybody little schedules. It's like bing, 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 bing. And I, I told so many people that, you know, you know, on some levels, Easter is my least enjoyable Sunday of the year because I, I don't feel like I can be the big goofball that I normally am. And... <sighs> All right, the children are out. We can go R-rated now, right? Welcome this morning to Resurrection Sunday at Cornerstone Family Church. If you're here visiting, just make yourself at home. We're so glad that you took time to come be with us today. Um, it means a lot to us, and I think it's going to mean a lot to you. This is about the Easter story, and most people know at least the primary points of Jesus dying and being laid in the grave and three days later coming to life. And what we have to understand is that our whole faith, everything we are, this whole thing called the church, the body of Christ, everything revolves around what we celebrate on this day, 
I want to read you a passage of Scripture from John about the resurrection of Jesus. And let's see, even as those children were trying to get a handle on what Easter was about, let's take this thing to the adult level today, and let's understand it more than the bullet points of those three days. And let's see if we can get a deeper understanding of what Easter is all about. We pick this up in John. It says, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. This was after he was crucified and had died. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, by the way, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. And this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place, and a lot of people haven't noticed this, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden, a new tomb in which, he, which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Um, and let's just continue into what would be the next chapter of the Bible, though there should not have been a break here at all. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, which was John, by the way, who wrote this and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. And so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. And both were running, but the other disciple, <laughs> what a narcissist, <laughs> the other disciple, not mentioning any names, outran Peter <laughs> and reached the tomb first. <laughs> he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. Saw and believed. And they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He had to rise from the dead to establish that the work of the cross was not just one of many Jews who had been crucified. I drew your attention to one of those verses there, um, and there are some points in that passage that most Christians know, but it was years before I picked up on something concerning where Jesus was crucified and where the tomb was. I knew that the tomb was in a garden, but it was years before I realized that the tomb and the garden was right there where he was crucified. John was very specific about that, and he was also very specific to say it was in a garden. Isn't it interesting things that started in ancient cultures have carried through, and to this day we consider our cemeteries gardens, gardens. Is this just a piece of information that is insignificant? That Jesus was laid to rest in a garden, in a tomb, and he came out of that tomb in that garden three days later? Is it an insignificant piece of information? Or is it one of the most prophetic, important pieces of information in the Bible? You see, what just took place in a garden with the resurrection of the Redeemer of humanity. All of this took place because what initially took place in a garden many hundreds of years earlier. You see, it was there in the garden in Eden that God made man. And He put man in the garden 
And man was in a very intimate place with God there. The Bible talks about how they walked in the cool of the day together. They talked and there was intimacy between God and man. And the garden in Eden was a place that we, in our minds, we consider to be one of the most beautiful pictures imaginable. Now God set man up in that garden. He set him up to see how he would use the most powerful gift that he gave him, the gift of free will. Because though the garden was awesome and though man's life could be awesome and God was awesome, the future of humanity would depend on man's free will. What would he choose? What God wanted for man, relationship. What God wanted, children, family, the things God didn't have that God did want as he created us. He knew would just be a joke unless man would choose to want God. Choose to want to walk with God in the cool of the day. So God did something that may not make sense to a lot of people, but maybe to some parents it would make sense in how we train our, our children. He put two trees in the garden. One was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and one was called the tree of life. And we would find out later that that tree of life would in fact represent Jesus Himself. And he told Adam, he said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, including the tree of life. But don't eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that I've put in the center of the garden. Well, if you're parents, you know how this works. As soon as you tell your children, don't touch that. What do they do? As soon as you're... They touch it. If you say, don't go in there, they can't rest till they go in there. It's human nature, and God knew that it was human nature. And He knew what man's choice would be, which is why He prepared a plan. Man could eat from the tree of life and live. But God said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is man choosing a path for himself, which would say, I know right from wrong. I can choose my own path. God said, if you eat from that tree, you're going to die. And Adam and Eve ate from the tree. First Eve, but the Bible says with Adam standing right there beside of her, instead of guarding her and protecting her, he stood there and did nothing. When they made that choice, the choice led to death. And when God came to look for Adam, he said, Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was at. But Adam now was feeling guilty. He was filled with condemnation. He felt terrible. He felt ashamed. He knew that what he had done was terrible. He camouflaged himself in the fig leaves. God pulls Adam out of his hiding place. says, what have you done? And God declares, and now man will die. He removed Adam from the garden and cast him outside. And when that happened, Adam and us all had to face something that we would have never faced in the garden of God. Death. It wasn't just death of the physical body. It was going to be death of the spiritual man also. It was going to be a separation from God. In the garden, they were intimate. They were together. Outside of the garden, there was a separation. God was still there. God was on the scene. But there was not the intimacy that there was. And then we watch for 4,000 years of human history as man just stumbles along. As man tries to find his way with the law, the law is what man chose in the garden. When he chose to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, that's reflected in the law. God said, this is what you chose, so here, let's see how you can do with it. And man just stumbled in the dark, trying to acknowledge God from a distance trying to be what we would call a Christian, they would say a good Jew, but from a distance. 
You see, the Jews believed that God existed. There wasn't an issue there. They had manuscripts that, and, and scrolls that would later be inserted and compiled into what we call the Bible today. They knew about God. They believed that He was there somewhere, but it was far away. It was up there somewhere. But there was no intimacy with God. There was nothing personal with God. They struggled in their condemnation and their guilt and their shame. Isn't it ironic how those Old Testament Jews represent such a large segment of Christianity today? People who would call themselves Christians because they believe that God exists. If you ask them, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? They will say, yes, absolutely. I believe the Bible is real, that God is real. And they would call themselves Christians because they believe that. We have a word for that in theological circles. It's called cultural Christianity. And it was modeled first in the Bible through cultural Judaism. People who believed that God existed, they believed the scrolls were truly the word of God, but God and them were so distant. You see, just because you believe God exists doesn't make you close to God. It doesn't... It doesn't activate a relationship with God. It doesn't cause you to come into a place where you're walking with God in the cool of the day, where you know Him. God presents a plan very prophetically to the Jews as Moses leads them, prepares to lead them out of captivity. It's the story of all stories in the Bible. The story we call the Passover story. And he raises up Moses to lead the people from their bondage. And they're warring with Pharaoh and the plagues all come into play and God's doing whatever He has to do to get His people set free. And the final plague, of course, was the coming of the death angel and the death angel would kill the firstborn sons and Every single part of the story is so deeply prophetic. The imagery is beyond profound. It all comes into play later on. The death angel comes and he's going to take out the children. And, but God says, but if you take a lamb, a perfect lamb, and you slay that lamb, and you take that lamb's blood and you put it over the doorway... When the death angel comes, he will pass over your house and you will live. What a powerful picture of the Lamb of God, Jesus. And then many generations we find him, the very Son of God. He's God, but he's man. He's, he's, he's finding his identity as both, but he chooses to lay aside the, the identity of the deity part of who He is to become one of us. He chooses to walk the earth as one of us. He chooses to experience life as one of us. He chooses to allow Himself to be tempted in all ways just like us. He goes through persecution. He goes through affliction. He goes through all kinds of adversity. He experiences the stresses of life. He experiences rejection. He experiences everything that we experience in life. He chose to do that as one of us. He experienced life as one of us and then He went to the cross as one of us, as that Lamb. The Bible says that because Adam fell, only Adam can restore. The Lamb had to be perfect and unblemished. But before he becomes unblemished, he's got to go through a lot of stuff that could blemish him. You know the story. They whip him. They mock him. They pull out his beard. They beat him. They, they hang him on a cross. He gives up the ghost. His blood is shed. And the Bible's very specific about how the blood and the water from his body drips down onto the earth. More prophetic imagery. 
as Paul talks about how we are born through the blood and through the water. And if you're a woman here that has given birth, you understand that imagery so well. Jesus dies and they put him in the grave, which is where we picked the story up. The trouble is, is that there were countless Jews being beaten. There were countless Jews being crucified. And to be very honest with you, there were quite a few who had a Messiah complex and told people, I'm the Messiah, because it was the greatest prophecy that the Jews had been waiting on. It had been the water cooler talk for generations. When will he come? When will the Messiah come? He came and he was hung on a cross, but there's still nothing to be quite honest with you if you're standing back from a distance that is standing out in the crowd yet. There was one to his right and one to his left the day that he was crucified. The Bible talks about even after this season of human history with the Roman emperors, especially Nero, how he crucified hundreds of Jews. In fact, the, the roadway going to his palace was lined with Jews on stakes, covered in oil, lit on fire that became human torches. It was sadistic. It was barbaric. It was inhumane what was going on with humanity. And Jesus was just one of them in the midst of it all. But some people recognize there's something special about him. And they put him in the grave and on the third day, the stone is rolled away and Jesus is no longer there. And suddenly we find he's not just another crucified Jew. He's not just one of the pack. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was the overcoming of death, hell, and the grave. To make a long story short, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that garden restored what was lost in the first garden with Adam. What Adam lost, Jesus restored as he comes back to life. What Adam chose when God dismissed Adam and Eve from the garden, he placed a cherubim with a flaming sword there, the Bible says, to guard the way to the garden because man could not be allowed to come in and eat from the tree of life in a fallen condition, the Bible says. That cherubim was embroidered on the veil of the holy of holies in the temple. The cherubim with a flaming sword. And the Bible says that when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross and he died, the earth began to shake and the temple began to shake and the veil ripped. And it opened the way to the holy of holies. The place that signified where God is at. Once again, the way is made open for man to come back in. Not just believe that God exists. Not just believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Not just say, I'm a Christian because I, I believe all that and maybe even go to church. But now the way was open for man to leave the garden of death, the grave, and come back into the garden where there is life. The Garden of Eden, man turned the garden into a grave. The grave where Jesus was, was buried, he turned back into a garden. I like that song you all sang the other night at the Holy Week service. Graves into gardens. Look at this passage in Romans Romans 8.11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. 
God wanting us to know that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, this is not just a story that you believe in and it makes you a Christian. Just because you know the story of Easter, just because you believe the story of Easter. Paul said, if this resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave is now inside of you, it will bring life back to you. You see, we all know people who call themselves Christians and they don't have a whole lot of life. They're like zombies walking around. And not that battling anxiety and depression and worry, not that that is not human, because all humans can battle those things, whether they're Christians or not. But when we see people who that becomes their identity, there's no life in them. You see, we focus so much on the fact, on the fact that the resurrection of Jesus now guarantees us eternal life after this age that we forget the death that happened in the Garden of Eden was not just a physical death. It was a death in the soul. Solomon, King Solomon, said concerning the Shulamite woman who was a prophetic picture of us, the church, the body of Christ. He said, inside of you, woman, there is a garden. It became understood in Jewish culture, that the soul of man would be represented by a garden. The place where we commune with God, where we walk with God in the cool of the day. Today, every single one of you in this room, all looking beautiful in your Easter outfits. And I don't know, we're not a hat church, are we? My wife's the only one that ever wears a hat. We came out of churches years ago where everybody, all the ladies, wore hats. Every one of you guys that are here today, you believe in God. You wouldn't be here probably. You know the Easter story, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you absolutely believe it. You believe that the Bible is the Word of God. The question is, have you invited, opened up the veil of your heart and allowed this resurrected Christ to come into your garden and sup with you and walk with you and talk with you? If this resurrection power is in you, it will bring life even to your mortal body. It will bring life to your mind and to your emotions It'll bring life into your marriage, into your family. It'll bring life into your thoughts and, and the vision and the dreams that you have for your future. How you see life, how you perceive life, how your expectations for life. It'll bring life to you. Look at this last passage in Colossians. I'm sorry, in Philippians 3:10. I want to know you, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship, the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, uh, becoming like Him in His death. Leave that there just for a second. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I don't want to know about Christ. I want to know Christ. Remember the story of Job? Job went through all that stuff. At the very end of the story, Job said to God, he said, I used to know all about you. But now I know you. The story of us. I want to know Christ. Not just believe in His existence. I want to know Christ. And the, I want to know the power of His resurrection. More than a historical event that took place 2,000 years ago. That same power that brought Jesus out of the grave. It brings us out of our graves. The story, I love the story of, of Jesus crossing over the lake into a place called Gatherings. And there he was approached by a demoniac. And the Bible says that the, the demoniac lived among the tombs. He lived in a graveyard. That demoniac we see is such an extreme picture. It's like that we could never see ourselves in that picture. I want you to know, I remember the days in my life where that well represented me. 
Just a madman in life. You picture a demoniac with his clothes ripped off and and just slobbering and just all disheveled and hair all over the place and just a madman with no purpose and no point to life living in a graveyard. And we sometimes need to stop and look at our life and think, is that picture really too extreme when I think about where I'm at in my life? I want to know Christ. I want to know Him. And I want to know the power of His resurrection in me and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. There are many of you today that understand the difference between knowing Him and knowing about Him. Believing in His existence and believing upon Him. There are differences. Today is the day that we remember the most significant event in human history. The resurrection of the one who redeemed humanity, ripped the veil, opened the way back to that original garden where we can come back in now and personally choose to eat from the tree of life. The whole point of the resurrection was being restored to a place where we eat of Christ, put Him back inside of us. Whether it's the Passover lamb, whether it's the tree of life, whether it's the bread of life, all these pictures of Jesus, what do they have in common? It's something you eat and put inside of you. And then you become what you eat. And that's what Paul just said. I want to be like you. Today I want to pray for us. And I want you to know something. From a guy who grew up in church where altar calls were just, they were long, they were, they were laborious, they were intense, there was a lot of begging and screaming and, and reciting and repeating and getting it all down just right. I want you to know that all that's man-made. The biblical pattern of giving your life to Jesus and saying, I don't just want to know about you, I want to know you. It was so simple in the Bible. You see, the very fact that you're here today helps you come to a place where you, you already know, if you're a sinner, you already know that. You know your struggles in life. But in the Bible, when people met Jesus, there was an acknowledgement. I am a sinner. You are the Savior. And the only way this is going to work is if I just give it all to you. I can't fix my sin. I can't manage my sin. I, I, can't, I can't manage my sin through law, through legalism. So you just give it all to Him. And then you keep struggling as He's helping you. We thought you get it from the altar and you walk out and you don't sin anymore. You're perfect. Maybe that worked that way for you. It didn't work that way for me. But I found that now I had a way I could work on it with him. He could teach me. In the Bible, people just, they, they, they believed that Jesus was the Christ and they gave their lives to him in the Bible by saying, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. They didn't have altars. They didn't do sinners' prayers. They didn't do all those things. They just said, I believe He is the Christ, and I want to give Him my life. In the Bible, the disciples, I want you to understand that picture of the disciples. They were fishermen. They were tent makers. They were tax collectors. They they were doctors. They all had jobs. And when they left those jobs to follow Jesus, that was the picture of them giving their lives to Him, saying, I don't want my life anymore. I want your life. So we give our lives to Him just by simply acknowledging, you are the Savior. You are my Savior. You have forgiven my sins. You forgave my sins 2,000 years ago. Today, I just want to say to you, I accept that. I believe that and I accept that you have died for my sins. You have forgiven my sins. Here, take them. And I want to follow you. I want to to know you and the resurrection power that brought you out of the grave. I want that 
in me, bringing me out of my grave. If I'm speaking to you at all, I want to pray for you. And today, through the simple choice of which tree you want to eat from, if you want to live in the garden of God or you want to live in a graveyard that man calls a garden, that's your choice. Today, through simple, simple choice, you can choose to give your life to and begin to follow this Jesus who came out of this grave to restore you back to a place where you could know God and your grave can be turned into a garden. Would you just stand with me this morning just for a second? We stand before you, Lord, not because a preacher just asked them to stand, but Lord, in my heart, they're standing before you because it's our way of acknowledging you are the Christ. And today, Lord, I want to stand with all of those in this room today who are uncertain, unsure of where they stand with you. I want to stand with those, Lord, that are certain because they know they don't walk with you. I want to stand, Lord, with those who would say, today my life starts new. Today I start a fresh beginning. Today I want to begin my born again experience with God. Today I want to give my life to Him and let Him, him turn my grave into a garden. Lord, by the power of Your Spirit, Make this a simple thing for people. A simple step of faith that we accept, we believe, and we follow. Thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven our sins. Thank you that the veil was ripped. Thank you that all we have to do is step back in to the place where you are. Save us, O oh God. Today, Hosanna, save us. Even now, Holy Spirit, may we feel the intimate, cleansing, love, grace, mercy, kindness, and compassion that is you just flooding our souls, setting us free, free from shame, guilt, condemnation, and beginning to make us a new person. If you agree with that for your life, just say amen. 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 Set back down for just a second. Can we do something a little different than we've ever done here before? Because some of y'all were sitting there going, where's that video that we usually show before Pastor Scott teaches? You got a bunch of kids, you know, having fun here on a video and that's nice but where's that video you usually show well today we're going to leave this powerful imagery with you at the end praying that it will be imagery that just brands your soul and helps you remember and celebrate the resurrection of our Christ at the end of this video consider yourself dismissed I love you guys Kulet kehu Henke hell Kostige demini A kein luck is far Lehuay di luck is far <laughs>